Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. We are coming to the end of October, which means the end of the month always means book haul time. One of my favorite parts of the month. I love talking about books that I brought into my library and all of that fun stuff. I have nine books to talk to you about this month. I'm really excited about a lot of them. I've already read two of them, so let's dive in and talk about them. Before we do, I will let, just let you know my dog Teddy is hanging out in here with me just looking sad because I'm not paying any attention to him in order to film. So let's try to run through these so I can pay attention to Teddy and dive in the first book that I brought into my library in the month of October. It's actually something that I purchased right at the end of September, but I had already filmed my book haul for the month of September. So here it is. It's The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store by James McBride. I am a fan of James McBride, mostly because I just absolutely love The Good Lord Bird, which is this book faced out on my shelf right here. I love this book so much. I was a little less enamored of Deacon King Kong, which is next to it on that shelf. But because I love The Good Lord Bird so much, I'm still really just intrigued by anything that James McBride puts out. So I'm really looking forward to reading this book. It also recently won the Kirkus Prize for Fiction for 2023. And if you're unfamiliar with that, Kirkus is a literary magazine. They do a lot of book reviews of upcoming releases. And I have found them to be very consistent. So if they like something and give it a starred review, odds are pretty good that I'm going to like it as well. I've just found them to be pretty consistent like that. So the fact that this won the Kirkus Prize has me even more excited to get around to reading it myself. If you're interested in what this is about, in 1972, when workers in Pottstown, Pennsylvania were digging the foundations for a new housing development, the last thing they expected to uncover was a human skeleton. Who the skeleton was and how it got buried there were just two of the long-held secrets that have been kept for decades by the residents of Chicken Hill, the dilapidated neighborhood where immigrant Jews and African Americans lived side by side, sharing ambitions and sorrows. Chicken Hill was where Moisha and Chona Ludlow lived when Chona ran the Heaven and Earth grocery store, which served the neighborhood's quirky collection of blacks and European immigrants, helped by her husband Moshi, a Romanian-born theater owner who integrated the town's first dance hall. When the state came looking for a deaf black child claiming that the boy needed to be institutionalized, Chicken Hill's residents, roused by Chona's kindness and the courage of a local black worker named Nate Timblin, banded together to keep the boy safe. As the novel unfolds, it becomes clear how much the people of Chicken Hill have to struggle to survive at the margins of white Christian America and how damaging bigotry, hypocrisy, and deceit can be to a community. When the truth is revealed about the skeleton, the boy and the part the town's establishment played in both, McBride shows that it is love and community, heaven and earth, that ultimately sustain us. Really looking forward to this. I've heard a lot of really good things from people who already finished this book. I actually had this on deck to listen on audio right before we lost our, our dog, Jamie, and that sent me into, into a tailspin, and I did not actually manage to read it, but I'm hoping that this is going to be one of the next books that I read. I think there is huge Pulitzer Prize potential for this. I think since the release of The Good Lord Bird, James McBride has been making a pretty solid case for himself, and part of me is a little nervous about the Heaven and Earth grocery store because my problem with Deacon King Kong was that it had such a vast amount of characters that the story ultimately felt a little bit muddy to me and I kind of wanted a bit more of a clean narrative and this seems like it's very much in the mold of Deacon King Kong. However, I love James McBride as a storyteller so I'm willing to go on this journey. This is published by Riverhead. In my book hauls, I like to read a little bit from the opening of the book so let's do that right now. Part one is called Gone and chapter one is The Hurricane. There was an old Jew who lived at the site of the old synagogue up on Chicken Hill in the town of Pottstown, Pennsylvania, and when Pennsylvania state troopers found the skeleton at the bottom of an old well off Hayes Street, the old Jew's house was the first place they went to. This was in June 1972, the day after a developer tore up the Hayes Street lot to make way for a new townhouse development. That is the opening of the Heaven and Earth Grocery Store by James McBride, something I am definitely hoping to read by the end of this year. Then we have Of Time and Turtles, Mending the World, Shell by Shattered Shell by Cy Montgomery with illustrations by Matt Patterson. I read and absolutely loved 
Simon Montgomery's book about octopuses. It's The Soul of an Octopus. It's such a good book, and I actually really want to get a copy for my library, but I have not managed to track down a copy from... I've been looking in used bookstores. I may eventually uh, look for a newer copy, because I definitely want to get one of the ones that has... It almost has like a little flip book, so you can see an octopus moving around if you flip the pages in the corner. And that is really cool. I'd want to make sure I get an edition that has that. And this is just as beautiful as that. I don't know if you can see the detail on the cover. There is a crack in this turtle's shell and it's been bandaged up. I really want to read this. I was worried about how emotional I think it's going to make me. But now since we brought Teddy into the house, I think my heart has been healed a little bit enough since, since we lost Jamie that I, I, I'm going to be okay but I'm really looking forward to reading this. It sounds like a really beautiful story. And I know Simon Montgomery does really beautiful work writing about animals. There are painted and snapping turtles whose shells were crushed by cars, spotted turtles who were chewed by dogs, box turtles with shells deformed from years of inept care in captivity, exotic pet tortoises abandoned by their owners, turtles res rescued from the illegal trade in wildlife, and baby turtles hatched from eggs rescued from slain mothers. Some of these cases seem hopeless. Turtles arrive with brain trauma, broken jaws, missing limbs. Fire Chief, a 42-pound, 60-year-old snapping turtle, was hit by a truck, leaving his back legs paralyzed, his shell smashed and bloodied. But Turtle Rescue League's motto is never give up on a turtle. And when National Book Award finalist Simon Montgomery and wildlife artist Matt Patterson joined the group as volunteers, they took part in heart-pounding dramas and breathtaking miracles. Working with extraordinary humans and extraordinary turtles, including Fire Chief, forever changed their lives in ways they never could have suspected. During the pandemic, much of the human world languished, but while helping heal the wounded, visiting a breeding family for the world's most endangered species, protecting backyard nests, and rescuing endangered, cold-stunned sea turtles from a wintry beach, Montgomery and her companions found hope and meaning. In an era when clock and calendar seemed to stall, turtles, ancient, long-lived, shell-covered creatures whose kind arose with the dinosaurs, proved to be unexpected guides to probing the mysteries of time itself. So I think you can see why there's definitely a sense of sadness in here, but there's also healing and hope, which could probably be good. So I'm really looking forward to this. The audio of this is actually on Scribd. However, this is such a beautiful book that I really wanted to have a copy of it. And a lot of that comes to these illustrations by Matt Patterson. You can see one on the cover there. Let me find another one in the book for you. Here we go. There is one. There are also photos of the turtles in the middle of the book. Let me just uh, find those and I'll find a good one for you. All right. I think there's a photo of Fire Chief. Yeah. Here we go. This is Fire Chief, the, the turtle that was mentioned in the description of the book. So I really just wanted to have this book because it is so incredibly beautiful. Here's another illustration. And had to have it on the shelf, even though the audio is available. And I, as I have learned from my book haul revisits, I'm much more likely to read a nonfiction book on audio. That's how I listened to The Soul of an Octopus. But uh, yeah, I just really couldn't resist having this book in my library, especially since I know that I love The Soul of an Octopus so much. So here it is. Let's read a little bit from the beginning. Chapter one is called Shell Shock. And it has an illustration of Pizza Man, a red-footed tortoise. Amid all the other homes on the suburban street, white, beige, gray, pale blue, light yellow, the, this two-story salt box stands out. It's a blazing neon green, its flamboyance accentuated by an equally electrifying violet shed out back. The house bears a sign in front that reads, Turtle Lover Parking Only. Violators better shut the shell up. That's the opening of Of Time and Turtles. Mending the World Shell by Shattered Shell by Simon Montgomery with illustrations by Matt Patterson. Really looking forward to this. I'm also hoping to read this one by the end of the year. Now we have a book I am actually currently reading. It's Loved and Missed by Susie Boyt. This and The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store were actually uh, some of my most anticipated books. I believe I knew Heaven and Earth Grocery Store was coming in the beginning of the year, and this was one of the ones that I found out about uh, when I did my video about my most anticipated reads for the second half of 2023. I've already started reading it, and this book is really impeccable and observant, and I'm really loving it so far. I can't wait to finish. The description on the back says... Ruth is a woman who believes in and despairs of the curative power of love. Her daughter, Eleanor, who is addicted to drugs, has just had a baby, Lily. 
Ruth adjusts herself in ways large and small to give to Eleanor what she thinks she may need, nourishment, distance, affection, but all her gifts fall short. After someone dies of an overdose in Eleanor's apartment, Ruth hands her daughter an envelope of cash and takes Lily home with her. And as Lily grows, she proves a compensation for all of Ruth's past defeats and disappointments. Love without fear is a new feeling for her, almost unrecognizable. Will it last? Loved and Missed is a whip-smart, incisive, and mordantly witty novel about love's gains and missteps. British writer Susie Boyd's seventh novel, the first to be published in the United States, is a pitch-perfect work of art. And so far, the chapters that I have read of the book really live up to that. By the way, I forgot to mention that Of Time and Turtles is published by Mariner. This is published by the New York Review of Books. And it definitely has that New York Review of Books look to it. Let's read a little bit from the opening. Chapter one. I had a few old ghosts in the evening, a solemn deposition in coats and scarves. I still thought of them as the girls, Christine, Sarah, Fran. We were a tight four at one point, taking the piss out of each other religiously, confiding at the bus stop in our Cortel V-necks, high-spirited, insane for mascara, a bit valiant, desperate to trespass. That is the opening of Loved and Missed by Susie Boy, my current read, and something I am really enjoying so far. One of the two books that I have already read is, in the form of a question, The Joys and Rewards of a Curious Life by Amy Schneider. If you are unfamiliar, Amy Schneider went on a pretty miraculous run on Jeopardy as a champion and became the person with the second largest number of wins. The number one, of course, being Ken Jennings, who is now one of the hosts of the show since Alex, Alex Trebek passed away. Amy Schneider also won the Tournament of Champions and is a transgender woman and uh, now has written a book about her life. And I, I ended up listening to it on audio, but I really had wanted to own a copy of the book anyway. So here it is. I had pre-ordered it through Montana Book Company and I read it and I didn't love it, but I did like it. Um, I think it's one of those situations where sometimes getting to know your heroes <laughs> isn't always the best thing. However, it is a pretty honest and raw memoir, and I did appreciate that. So this is something that I have already read. Uh, but let's read a little bit from the flap. Even though I've already read it, I just want to make sure, I, since I'm doing this that for all of the other books, I might as well just be consistent. Who is Amy Schneider? In eighth grade, Amy Schneider was voted most likely to appear on Jeopardy by her classmates. Decades later, this trailblazer finally got her chance. Not only did she walk away with $1.3 million while captivating the world with her impressive 40-game winning streak, but she made history and won an even greater prize, the joy of being herself on national television and leading the way for openly queer and transgender people around the world. Now she shares her singular journey that led to becoming an unlikely icon and hero to millions. Her superpowers? Boundless curiosity and fearless questioning of the world. Let's read a little bit from the beginning. This is published by Avid Reader Press. So each chapter has a question, and then the chapter sort of answers the question. So the first chapter is called, How Did You Get So Smart? How did you get so smart? It's a question I've been asked all my life in many variations. In childhood, it was often asked with a certain amount of jealousy or disdain. One reason for that disdain was the environment I was raised in. Pride is one of the worst sins in Catholicism, and the largely German Catholic community I was part of defined pride broadly. So broadly, in fact, that the mere fact of being talented in some field raised suspicions. Another reason was that, well, kids can be real a-holes sometimes. That is the opening of In the Form of a Question by Amy Schneider. Then we have How to Protect Bookstores and Why, The Present and Future of Book Selling by Danny Kane. I am hoping to read this by the end of the year. Uh, Danny Kane is one of the co-owners of The Raven Bookstore in Lawrence, Kansas, which I have not been to but is on my bookstore bucket list. Danny Kane has become one of the leading bookstores or bookstore owners um, in the country, speaking out against Amazon and the way the book selling and publishing industry is currently just gives Amazon so much power. So his previous book was How to Resist Amazon and Why. I am a huge fan of that book. So ultimately, I was destined to get a copy of this. 
This is, uh, and it, it comes from an independent publisher. I cannot remember the name. It's Microcosm Publishing, based out of Portland, Oregon. Why bookstores matter and how we can help. Can bookstores save the world? As bastions of culture, anchors of local retail districts, community gathering places, and sources of new ideas, inspiration, and delight, maybe they can, but only if we protect them and the critical roles they fill in our communities. That's a little bit from the back of the book. Let's just jump to a bit from the opening of the book, because I think this one is pretty self-explanatory. Chapter 1, Layers of Community, Birch Bark Books and Native Arts, Minneapolis, Minnesota. In many ways, the roots of this book were planted in March 2020. Broadly, the coronavirus pandemic reshaped the work of bookstores so significantly that it's impossible to write about contemporary bookselling without considering it. Narrowly, that's when I met Pulitzer Prize winning novelist and bookstore owner Louise Erdrich when she came to Lawrence for an event hosted by my bookstore, The Raven. I'm going to stop there. And this is particularly poignant because I have been to Birch Bark Books in Minneapolis, which is the bookstore that Louise Erdrich owns, or at least co-owns. Uh, and it is, it is a great bookstore if you are ever in Minneapolis. So this was an obvious choice for me. I pre-ordered it pretty much the moment that I heard about it. And here is the copy of it all these months later. Now we get to the second book that I have already read. It's Roman Stories by Jumba Lahiri. I'm a huge Jumba Lahiri fan. I have read everything that she has published in fiction, and this was no exception. I actually read this as an e-galley from NetGalley, and I liked the book so much that I kept my pre-order of it because I already own all of her other fiction books, except for Whereabouts. I'm missing a copy of Whereabouts. And my local used bookstore has a copy that I have been coveting for a couple of weeks, and I really hope nobody purchases it because it's in my mind that I really need to get it to complete my collection of Jhumpa Lahiri fiction books. I also just really love the cover of this. When Joel and I were in Italy last year, we saw a lot of these trees, especially in Rome, but uh, just in that region of Italy. So the fact that this cover is so beautiful and that it has something that we really loved when we were there really speaks to me. So this is a story collection, and it calls back to Interpreter of Maladies, which was Jhumpa Lahiri's first book, which won her the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. But Jhumpa Lahiri is really interesting. She definitely is a writer who's not interested in doing the same thing. She has evolved a lot. So this calls back to Interpreter of Maladies, but it's not the same at all. And this really reflects her life in Italy uh, and the culture in Rome there's a palpable love for Rome, even as it grapples with some of the more problematic things, including racism that is experienced by people of color in the area. I really loved this book, and I hope a lot of other people are reading it now that it has been released. And let's do a little bit from the flap, because again, even though I've read it and I've kind of talked about what it's about, I've, I've been reading from the flap for the other books, so I want to do the same for this one. In the Boundary, a family vacations in the Roman countryside, though we see their lives through the eyes of the caretaker's daughter who nurses a wound from her family's immigrant past. In Pease Parties, a Roman couple, now empty nesters, find comfort and community with foreigners at their friend's yearly birthday gathering until the husband crosses a line. And in the steps, on a public staircase that connects two neighborhoods and the residents who climb up and down it, we see Italy's capital in all of its social and cultural variegations, filled with the tensions of a changing city. Visibility and invisibility, random acts of aggression, the challenge of straddling worlds and cultures, and the meaning of home. These are splendid, searching stories written by in Lahiri's adopted language of Italian and seamlessly translated by the author and by Knopf editor Todd Portnowitz. They are stories steeped in the mood, moods of Italian master Alberto Moravia and guided in the concluding tale by the ineluctable ghost of Dante Alighieri, whose words lead the protagonist toward a new way of life. Really love this collection. Hope a lot of people are reading it and enjoying it as much as I did. So again, I read a little bit from the beginning of each book. If the book is a story collection, I read a little bit from the first story. And the first story in this is called The Boundary. Every Saturday, a new family comes to stay. Some arrive early in the morning from afar, ready to begin their vacation. Others don't turn up until sunset in bad moods, maybe having lost their way. It's easy to get lost in these hills. The roads are poorly signposted. Today, after they introduce themselves, I show them around. My mother used to do the welcoming, but she's spending the summer in a nearby town helping out an elderly gentleman who's also on vacation 
so I have to do it. That is the beginning of Roman Stories by Jumbo Lahiri, a wonderful book. I would absolutely recommend it to you, and I'm happy to have this copy of it here in my library. The next is actually something that was gifted to me by Erica from The Broken Spine. Erica is a huge fan of River Solomon and of this book, Sorrowland, in particular, to the point where she has multiple copies of this book, so she offered to send me one that she has because she would like me to read this. So I uh, agreed, and I will get to it at some point. I, it does sound like a really interesting book, and uh, the way Erica has talked about it has really sparked my interest in it. This, oh, by the way, uh, Roman Stories is published by Knopf, and this is published by Picador. Vern, seven months pregnant and desperate to escape the strict religious compound where she was raised, flees for the shelter of the woods. There she gives birth to twins and plans to raise them far from the influence of the outside world. But even in the forest, Vern is a hunted woman. Forced to fight back against the community that refuses to let her go, she unleashes incredible br brutality far beyond what a person should be capable of, her body racked by inexplicable and uncanny changes. To understand her metamorphosis and to protect her small family, Vern has to face the past, and more troublingly, the future outside the woods. Finding the truth will mean uncovering not only the secrets of the compound she fled, but also the violent history of America that produced it. River Solomon's Sorrowland is a genre-bending work of gothic fiction. Here, monsters aren't just individuals, but entire nations. This is a searing, seminal book that marks the arrival of a bold, unignorable voice in American fiction. Sounds intriguing, right? And there's a really beautiful title page in the book. Now we get to part one, which is called Kingdom Plante. The child gushed out from twixt Vern's legs, ragged and smelling of salt. Slight he was, and feeble as a promise. He felt in her palms a great wilderness, such a tender thing as he could never be parsed fully by the likes of her. Had she more strength, she'd have limped to the river and drowned him. It'd be a gentler end than the one the fiend had in mind. That is the intriguing opening of Sorrowland by Rivers Solomon. And thank you, Erica, from The Broken Spine. I'll put a link to her channel in the description box down below. We have two more books to get to. First is Love and Summer, a novel by William Trevor. So if you've been watching my recent Friday Reads video, I have been talking about how my husband Joel and I are planning a trip to Ireland and Scotland next year in 2024. And before we go, I'm hoping to read a lot more Irish and Scottish authors. William Trevor is Irish. I've heard really great things about his books and have never read one before. So I went to my local used bookstore. They did not have a big selection of his books, but they had this one, and this was one of the ones that I believe Brian at Bookish had recommended. So I picked it up, and here it is, and I'm really looking forward to reading it before we leave. Uh, our trip is in May, so I, I'm hoping to have read it by then. Ellie Dillahan is a shy orphan girl from the hill country, married to a man whose life has been blighted by an unspeakable tragedy. Ellie lives a quiet life in the small Irish town of Rathmoy, until she meets Florian Kildary, a young photographer preparing to leave Ireland and his past forever. The chance intersection of these two lost souls sets in motion a poignant love affair that requires Ellie to make an impossible choice. In spare, exquisite prose, William Trevor delves into the circumscribed lives of the people of Rathmoy, exploring their passions and frustrations during one long summer. I've heard a lot of really great things about William Trevor. I'm looking forward to finally reading one of his books. This is published by Viking. Let's read a little bit from the beginning of this book. Chapter 1. On a June evening, some years after the middle of the last century, Mrs. Eileen Canulty passed through the town of Rathmoy, from number four, the square, to McGinnis Street, into Hurley Lane, along Irish Street, across Cloud Jordan Road, to the Church of the Most Holy Redeemer. Her night was spent there. It's the opening of Love and Summer by William Trevor. Looking forward to reading that before we leave on our trip in May. The final book was purchased for the exact same reason as William Trevor. It's Roddy Doyle. It is a trilogy of books. I can't remember. It's the Barrytown trilogy. I couldn't remember the name of it. So it's The Commitments, The Snapper, and The Van. I did a video a while ago where I looked at the results when I searched for the best Irish novels and authors. I'll put a link to that video down below. And since I did that video, The Commitments in particular has been recommended to me 
a lot. So when we decided to book our tickets to Ireland and Scotland, and I decided that I wanted to read a lot of Irish and Scottish authors before we go, Roddy Doyle and the Commitments was immediately a book that I wanted to reach for. My local used bookstore had this edition of the book, which has the whole trilogy. And this is published by Penguin. And although this is three books, it's not actually that long. So there are three books, and it is about 627 pages. So you do the math, you can figure out each book is not actually that long. I'm definitely going to start with the commitments and decide how much further I want to go before we go on our trip in May, but I, de I do for sure want to read the commitments before we leave. Here's what it says on the back. Uh, actually, there is no description on the back of the book, and... There is not a description here either. I've also heard really good things about the movie adaptation of The Commitments. Let me just pull up a description of the book online, and then I can read it to you from that. All right. On Bookshop, there is an edition that has the Barrytown Trilogy, so let's read what it says from that. The Barrytown Trilogy gathers Roddy Doyle's first three novels into one volume. The Commitments, one of the funniest rock and roll novels ever written, about a group of aspiring musicians on a mission to bring soul to Dublin. The Snapper, about the progression of 20-year-old Sharon Rabbit's pregnancy on her family. And The Van, a finalist for the Booker Prize, a tender and hilarious tale of male friendship, midlife crisis, and family life, set during the heady days of Ireland's brief euphoric triumphs in the 1990 World Cup. So that is what this is about. Let's read a little bit just from the opening of The Commitments. We won't go into the other two books. We'll ask Jimmy, said Outspan. Jimmy'll know. Jimmy Rabbit knew music. He knew his stuff, all right. You'd never see Jimmy coming home from town without a new album or a 12-inch or at least a 7-inch single. Jimmy ate Billity Maker in the NME every week and Hot Press every two weeks. He listened to Dave Fanning and John Peel. He even read his sister Jackie when there was no one looking. So Jimmy knew his stuff. That's the opening of The Commitments, which is part of the Barrytown trilogy, and the final book in my October book haul. I would love to hear your thoughts if you have read any of these nine books. I would love to hear recommendations based on my interest in these nine books. All of that stuff, I'd love to hear what you've brought into your library in the month of October as well. Let me know all of that in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.